since uh, nobody has shown up since uh, before you came in. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and get this started here. Uh, so basically all we're going to do is a quick overview of the slides uh, and then open up for questions. Okay. Uh, one thing I do want to make note of is I posted an announcement earlier uh, while I was waiting uh, that the classical argument assignment is due this week. Uh, so make sure you've looked over the last two weeks worth of slides, uh, including this set. Uh, and then there's going to be a, a third set uh, that uh, posted today uh, that is for week, th week three of the class. That session will also be on Friday at noon. All right. So uh, this week we're looking at inductive versus deductive reasoning applying and applying debate technique to argument. Okay. So, first off, what's the difference between inductive and deductive reasoning? Well, inductive reasoning is performed by crafting a conclusion based on the existing evidence. Rather than seeking out evidence which backs up a pre-existing conclusion you want to reach, instead you adjust your conclusion to match where the actual facts exist. This is less commonly used in most argument essays because arguments are usually set prior to performing research. Uh, inductive re reasoning is basically what you do for most research papers, where you look at the facts first and then coming to a conclusion based on those facts. Deductive reasoning works backward from the conclusion, looking for evidence which justifies that conclusion. Facts you're seeking are the ones which will prove your argument. It's a more common style of reasoning used for arguments. It can also be seen as slightly easier to deal with as having a conclusion to focus on helps the focus research tighter. Okay, so you are going to be more focused on the conclusion you want to reach and how you're going to reach that based on the research you get, you're using. All right. Starting with inductive reasoning. The organization of an inductive reasoning essay typically follows four guidelines. First off, you demonstrate the relevance of the, to of the topic. Okay, so how is the, uh, how is the uh, research going to apl apply to the topic at hand? Okay, how is the argument going to apply to the topic? State the main argument and claims clearly. Okay, so we know what you're arguing and what you're claiming and how you're claiming that your argument fits in with your question or your research or your uh, topic. Arrange evidence that best supports the main conclusion. Okay, make sure that it's in a logical format that makes sense for the reader and allows it to build to your conclusion. Then interpret and analyze the evidence for the audience. Okay. Uh, Show them what they should be taking away from what you're presenting, okay? Uh, handling each one in context. Let's take a look at that. Sorry, relevance to the topic. You have to show how your argument on a smaller scale, a piece of evidence you're presenting is relevant to the overall topic of that argument, okay? And a relevant point is only going to act as signal noise. This is all about finding the stuff that is directly relevant to the research question you're working with and the argument you're trying to make, okay? Uh, so the example we have here is the stuff from the 2020 Iowa caucuses, uh, four articles that you're supposed to take a look at uh, and determine which one is least likely to match up with the thesis statement about the importance of having a backup plan for election security. Okay. This is the first of the lecture exercises for this for uh, week two. All right. Next comes arranging evidence interpretation. When you have the evidence to prove your point, it comes time to arrange it so that it's in the best, most logical order to support your main argument and your conclusion. There also has to be an explanation to the significance of every piece of evidence you present. So in other words, you have, must show why the facts point to your conclusion being the correct one. Uh, there's a second exercise here based on those uh, articles again. Of the three articles you felt were most applicable to the election security topic, Choose facts from the articles, the back of a thesis statement summarized as competent election security is vital to preserving an individual citizen's right to vote and have their voice heard in their government. Okay. So based on that thesis statement, uh, find the facts that are going to back that up from those three articles and then decide how you're going to arrange the facts you pulled from the articles to support the thesis statement in a logical fashion. Typically, you want to go strongest evidence first and then descending order in terms of strength. And then discuss how you justify including each fact you present, uh, what the overall meaning of that piece of evidence is in context with the thesis, and what point does it make to prove the thesis correct. 
Okay, next slide. Uh, that gives us a deductive reasoning, okay? The construction of a deductive reasoning argument typically works backward from the main conclusion it go and goes generally through this process, starting off by identifying the conclusion, and then examining your reasons, and for finally formulating the premise, how your conclusion is going to be proven correct based on those reasons that you've given. Okay, we're going to go through the steps again and get a handle on them. All right. So, starting off, identifying your conclusion, examining your reasons, this is basically your argument. Okay. You're going to want to make the central point of your essay as you continue to debate the opposition throughout it. Okay. This has to be what your entire argument has to focus on. Once you've identified your main conclusion, then you're going to need to look at why you have reached that conclusion. So this includes the reasons you're for your argument and how you justify thinking that way, okay? Uh, so this comes to the next exercise with those uh, three articles. Uh, you're going to use the notes from the inductive reasoning exercise about election security and the Iowa caucuses. And based on those alone, construct a conclusion you want to make, okay? And then from that conclusion, construct your reasons for its support. So think critically about all possible reasons there could be for coming to that conclusion based on the evidence you have before you. And at this point, you can also search for more evidence on the topic. Okay? And then finally, formulate the premise, the basic principle on which you will base your argument. If you do this right, this is where you'll find common ground between yourself and the audience. So you start, want to start, this is where you and the audience will come together. Okay? Uh, this is where syllogism becomes useful, okay? Structure syllogism is perfect for composing major and minor premises for the purposes of proving argument. Uh, if you are able to construct syllogism for your main problem and conclusion, it's then going to be easier to construct the full argument as the structure is going to be similar, okay? So this is the next exercise. You want to try to construct a working syllogism for your, for your take on election security, okay? Focusing solely on the premise you think would be easiest to prove and finding a logical means to prove that premise, okay? So these are all exercises that are intended to help you get started thinking about uh, how to construct an argument that's going to be uh, convincing and logical, okay? Uh, as far as general argument structure, the way the, S the argument essay should be formatted, you want to start first with the introduction where you state the uh, problem. Uh, and then use whatever hook you need to gain the audience's attention, okay? Get, their, get them to understand that you need to be listened to. Uh, make them uh, get invested in your topic. Then you have the main premise, where you present and explain the main premise you're using as the basis for your argument. At this point, you should also present the conclusion you intend to reach, okay? So this is going to be setting up what your argument actually is. Then we get to the reasons, why you should support the proposition. At this point, you also address counter arguments, okay? This is where you're gonna be trying to refute your opposition uh, and then present your side of things the way you want it to be presented. And then finally, your conclusion, where you're gonna restate the main conclusion with a summary of the evidence presented, which proves it. Uh, remind readers of the main premise and leave a lasting impression, okay? So, Give me a minute here. I understand, hey, this is not something that I should blow off. It's something that I should pay attention to. Okay? <sighs> okay. That gets us to debating. Okay? Uh, I include this because it sometimes can be helpful for writing uh, classical arguments. So let's talk briefly about debate. You may have a passing familiarity with debating from political debates where candidates make the case for their election. Now, uh, debate is different from, argue, from written argument that's a performative form of argument. Uh, oratory still has become equally as important as the point you're making and the logic you bring to bear for your argument. Okay. Uh, Debaters are still reliant on the main logical appeals, pathos, lo ethos, or logos as writers of written arguments. They're still going to rely on those. Those are, those are the centerpiece of all logical argument, okay? 
How debaters are also still just as prone to logical fallacies. Okay, by looking at how debates work, uh, we can use some of those elements and apply them to argument essays. So let's take a look at how debate is supposed to work. Okay, thanks. Bye. All right, I do apologize for that. All right. All right so debate. Debating has a particular structure for how topics are chosen and arguments are cited. Uh, this is mainly dealing with formal debates, that is, competitive style debates that you see in, uh, like, UIL, okay? Basic debate structure goes like this. First off, there's a topic chosen, typically called a resolution or a motion. Uh, in the case of classical arguments and most other written forms, this is basically going to be your premise, uh, what it is that you're going to be arguing. Now, in debate settings, team ar teams argue affirmative and negative. In debate competitions, it's usually determined by a coin flip. So there's no guarantee you'll agree with the side you wind up on, but you will still have to argue on its behalf, okay? You have a bit of a luxury when you're writing because you can decide what your side is going to be. You're in control of that. Uh, and a formal debate setting is purely by chance. Teams have an hour to prepare and speak for set time limits per member. And typically, a debate will run in three rounds, okay? So usually, your, your team is going to have three members, okay? Each it's going to take one round. Speakers alternate between sides, but the affirmative side always goes first. There's advantages and disadvantages of that, okay? Uh, the main advantage is the affirmative is going to be able to make the first impression. Disadvantage, though, is that the negative is always going to be able to make the last impression, okay? They always get the final word. The audience that the bears are primarily tailoring their arguments toward is the debate judge. While the judge is supposed to solely judge the quality of the arguments made, inherent biases may come into play. So you need to keep that in mind. You have to know your audience, okay? Because teams are usually made up of three speakers for each side. There's a particular role and order for each member of the team, okay? Uh, they're typically called a first, a second, and a third. So starting with the first affirmative, they will contextualize the debate, set out the team's interpretation, define terminology if necessary, then outline the argument and the team split, okay? Who's going to deliver, who will deliver which reasoning? and then provide two to three arguments supporting the motion, okay? The first negative, on the other hand, is going to recontextualize the debate as a rebuttal to affirmative, okay? They're going to say, okay, they, they see it one way, we see it this way, okay? Including differing definitions. If there's certain things that are defined by the affirmatives that the negatives are going to define differently, that's when you point them out here, okay? This outlines the argument and the team split, okay? Okay, just like the affirmative did, rebut the argument made by first affirmative and then provides two to three arguments opposing the motion. Okay, then you get to the seconds for each team. They will rebut the previous speaker, uh, clarify definitional issues, and deliver two to three more arguments. Uh, question is, would we have to make group debates in the semester? No. Uh, the only reason why I include debate technique in this is because it actually helps with classical, the classical argument. Uh, it'll, it actually helps you to try to think of it in terms of a spoken debate, but it's actually on paper, okay? Uh, and there's a lot of stuff to uh, debate. There's a lot of stuff to debate that uh, actually can apply to classical argument too. We're going to get to that in a second, okay? So again, for debate, typically in the second speaker, they're going to rebut the previous speaker, clarify definitional issues, and then deliver two or three more arguments. Then the third for each team are going to specifically rebut the seconds, specifically respond to attacks from the opposition, and conclude with a brief summary of their team's argument and reasoning. Again, the thirds, the third negative has the advantage here because they're they're going to get the final word. Okay. 
So let's apply this to written arguments now. Okay? It can be argued that each of the members of the debate team is producing their own short argument of essay and presenting it orally, but if you look at it holistically and compare it with the written argument, this is what they're doing. The first are presenting the background for the argument and its bigger picture meaning. Although there is a bit of dispute that takes place between them, it also emphasizes the differences between the sides. The seconds are presenting organized arguments to support the team's main premise using logical reasoning and evidence to support the premise. They're also running the opposition using logical reasoning and evidence. Okay? The thirds are offering the fullest rebuttal possible to the opposition while also concluding their team's argument with a brief summary and overview. It would also be their job to offer the parting shot that conclusions call for to convince the audience to keep the argument in mind. Okay? So each one of them can be lined up with a segment of a classical argument essay. Okay, the very basic structure that debaters use for their arguments is also highly helpful for writers. So this is their basic format, okay, their basic structure. Start with a claim, present the argument in a clear manner with a clear statement. Then present evidence, the facts that support the claim, including statistics, references, quotes, and so on. And then finally, the impact, what significance each piece of evidence has for the claim. How does, how do those pieces of evidence prove the claim to be correct? Claims in this case would be equivalent to reasons for supporting a side of an argument. Thus, this structure could be used for each part of an argument essay, offer a logical backing for the ideas presented. Okay? Then we have rebuttal. In a debate setting, rebuttal is typically limited to pointing out the logical shortcomings of the opposition and how claims may not hold up to tighter scrutiny. So, most typical fallacies present in, present in competitive debates are similar to ones that appear in written arguments as well, okay? Uh, these are some of the fallacies that, are, that, are, uh, that you want to avoid, okay? Uh, fal false dichotomy, the either-or fallacy, uh, there's never just, there's usually never just two sides to any issue, okay? Uh, assertion, statements that are not backed by evidence, typically uh, these are assumptions, they're based in biases. Uh, morally flawed statements and arguments that are questionable in their distribution of fairness and or morality. Okay. Uh, correlation versus causation. Just because it rains every time Mary comes to a picnic doesn't mean we don't invite Mary to the picnic. Okay. Uh, just because one thing happens when another thing happens doesn't mean that they're related. Failure to deliver promises. Speaker has promised evidence that they have not produced. Uh, straw man. Creating a false, exaggerated version of the opposition that's easier to attack. Okay. Uh, contradiction, presenting two conflicting arguments that cancel each other out, thus reducing the side's credibility. Uh, something that you really have to watch out for yourself, okay? And then compare the conclusion to reality. The conclusion presented is oversimplified and may have further complications if put into effect. Okay, so uh, just give an example. We can't all be uh, fit. We can't just solve the problem of... Uh, any of any issue just by throwing more money at it because we need to keep an eye on where that money goes. Okay. All right. So important skills for debating that carry over into classical argument. Okay. For the purposes of writing arguments, this comes down to these points. Okay. Make your points relevant to the topic. Okay. Everything has to stay focused on what your topic is and what your argument is. Provide evidence when you can, not just your own personal opinion. We need to have these backed up with facts. Remain objective when arguing. Passionate arguments can become illogical, so control your emotions. Okay? You need to make sure that you are doing this and keep control of your emotional range. All right? Consider the audience's attention span. Okay? How, how much patience does your audience have? Okay? Uh, they're probably not going to be have the patience for a dissertation, but maybe uh, three or four pages worth of argument over this topic might get their attention. Use pathos, ethos, and logos to support your rhetoric. Okay, use every element of use every element of logical argument to back up what you're trying to say. Employ comparative thinking. How would things be different if the opposition wins or status quo remains versus if you win? Okay, what's going to be changed for the better, what's going to be changed for the worse. Keep your language simple, okay? 
Don't try to overwhelm people with terminology and big words, okay? Make sure that you are using a language that's easy to understand. Avoid hyperbole. Don't use terms like always or never or this is the greatest, the biggest, yada, 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 okay? Uh, don't be like that. Also, avoid fallacious argument techniques such as falsifying data or evidence. That can get you in trouble. Attacking the arguer for the opposition rather than the opposing argument, that's an ad hominem uh, fallacy. You don't want to attack the speaker, you just want to attack what they're saying. Disagreeing with facts or obvious truths. Again, there's no such thing as alternative facts. If somebody is, if somebody is gleefully willing to ignore what's actually factual, they're not worth debating. Okay? And we have one more slide, and that is examples of debate. Okay? Uh, this was the last uh, activity, the last exercise in these lectures. Uh, we have some typical examples of how the average person experiences debate, and that would be political debates. So we have three video, three video clips here of debates. And I want you to uh, post observations to the discussion board uh, for this week's exercise. Uh, also reply to that thread for each one of these three videos. Give your re reactions to them. Uh, what you see, what you're seeing that are good debating techniques, and what you see that are bad argument techniques. Okay. All right. That was a lot of slides to get through in a short amount of time. Uh, we'll go ahead and uh, take some questions here. Uh, anybody has any questions in general uh, about the class at all? I know this is the, only the second one of these sessions. Uh, any questions about notes, anything like that? Uh, go ahead and fire away. Uh, raise a hand. I'll recognize you. Uh, question concerning classical assignment, okay. Classical argument. It is not a group exercise, it's individual, okay. Each one of you is going to have to make your own argument. Uh, topic is up to you. It has uh, in the slides. It says it has to be something related to current events. It also has to be something that is open to argument. That is, to say, it has at least two sides uh, that are in dispute. And you have to take one of the sides. This is not a test. This isn't just a general essay. Okay. I I don't open I don't open them up that early because I want to try to encourage you to get some feedback on them uh, before you turn them in. I don't want you turning in a rough draft as your final draft. Okay. So you're gonna. What opens up on Thursday is the link to actually allow you to turn it in. You're turning it in as a file attachment. All right.
All right, so uh, I'm just, I'm gonna go through this just real quick with you guys. I'm, I'm gonna go through it again uh, with the rest of the class on, uh, if anybody else shows up on uh, the Friday conference. Uh, but one of the things that you are supposed to be doing for this uh, class is the class discussion boards. Okay, it's not just the lecture exercises, it's also the weekly discussion topics. Now, I want to try to show you what I'm talking about here, okay? So give me a second here to set this up. Let's see. There it is. All right, so here is the discussion board, okay? We have three discussion forums here. Uh, as you can see, they have been very sparsely used. In fact, a couple of these, I'm the only, uh, uh, one of these, I'm the only one who's posted anything so far, okay? Uh, this is, I know we're on a rush schedule, but this is kind of disappointing. So this is what we're basically looking at. Uh, three forums. One of them is weekly discussion topics. That you need to uh, post uh, a response to every week. Second one is the team discussion threads. When we get into things like workshopping and uh the later team exercise, which is the annotated bibliography, uh, you need to have these threads up and running. You need to have them formed and get these threads running so that you can keep communication with your team. Uh, third one, video lecture exercises. This is where you post the responses to all of the uh, exercises that are in the slides. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to go over, I've gone over the uh, exercises in the video lectures. Uh, I want to go over the weekly discussion topics because there are three topics currently posted. I want to make sure everybody was aware of these and that you should be posting to these, okay, as you go along. I know one has been ha already had a response posted to it, uh, but we need to have full participation in these. This is a good chunk of your grade here. All right, so. First off, the responses to these uh, questions need to be at least three paragraphs in length. Uh, this one I'm going to count because that's three paragraphs worth of uh, content. He just shoved it into an entire one single paragraph. Uh, but it needs to be at least three paragraphs in length, and they have to be full paragraphs, not just one line, one line, one line done. Okay? Uh, and they have to answer the question uh, that's posed at the end of the uh, text here. Okay? Uh, for each one. All right, so the uh, discussion topic for this week. First, the recent hot news in investment circles has been the next version of cryptocurrency non-fungible tokens or NFTs. These new, not particularly easy to explain investment products are basically digital assets that are stored in the same blockchain system that cryptocurrencies use, making them unique and granting value based, granting the value based on what people are willing to pay for them even though they exist solely as black blockchain data. The most headlines derived from NFTs this far came from Jack Dorsey, the founder of Twitter, who sold an NFT as his, of his first tweet at auction, where it went for $2.5 million. Others have started offering NFTs of artwork, video stills, video, audio samples, and other forms of digital files. Okay? The frenzy for NFTs, however, is creating concern on multiple fronts. Artists are concerned because scams are rising where potential NFT speculators steal artwork to create NFTs to sell, usually through Twitter bots, which link a posted artwork to a digital blockchain wallet. Environmentalists have raised concern due to the amount of energy the computers running the blockchain systems require, that, uh, that the power requirements are creating higher amounts of pollution from power stations. Additionally, it comes down to the basic idea that NFTs only have value because investors believe they do. This could potentially lead to a new high-tech investment bubble that when it bursts could devastate real-world economies. For your discussion this week, argue for or against investment in NFTs. Are there any ethical considerations to take into account when getting into this market? If you are made aware of an NFT you own being created from stolen art, how would that affect your decision on whether to invest in NFTs? Would you personally put money into an NFT, and why or why not? Now, to help you with this question, we do I do give you five sources of information. You can do further research if you want to, but this is a good starting point. Uh, one's from links from Festopedia. What is a non-fungible token? Uh, one from Benzinga. Jack Dorsey NFT sale of first ever tweet secures 2.5 million dollar bid on auction's expiry. 
One from The Guardian, The Hidden Cost of the Craze for Non-Fungible Tokens. Uh, we have one from Vice, People are Stealing Art and Turning it into NFTs. The last one from Polygon, NFTs are generating huge paydays for some artists, other feel, others feel under siege. Okay. So this is the topic that you will be responding to uh, with a three-paragraph response. That's the first one. Okay. These are posted on a weekly basis. And suddenly this, if you're looking for this one, the title of it is Money for Nothing But Your NFTs Aren't Free. So the next, the next one that was posted last week, uh, the predicament of the good ship ever given. And here's the topic. Last Tuesday, all eyes around the world suddenly turned to the Suez Canal in Egypt, where the massive container ship ever given had turned perpendicular in the canal and lodged itself, blocking the canal entirely. Efforts to unblock the canal and move the ship have been met with frustration as the ship's massive weight led to it becoming lodged in the sandy bottom of the canal. As of today, March, Mar uh, Monday, March 29th, the Ever Given was finally underway as high tide and mechanical aids were able to free the ship from its diagonal position in the canal. As the ship remained stuck and unmoving, shipping traffic and other naval traffic, including some Russian warships, backed up considerably with no outlet. Eventually, much of the traffic wound up turning around to an alternate course around Cape Horn in Africa, the route shipping took in the centuries prior to the construction of the Suez Canal. The delays and excess costs caused by this redirection is likely to cause economic repercussions for months after the ship itself is freed from the canal. Already, some shipping companies are talking up charging a Cape fee for redirecting cargo around Cape Horn. In addition, there is also dealing with delays of vital supplies being shipped on both delayed ships and the Ever Given itself. This included numerous oil tankers and container ships carrying shipments of COVID vaccines. For your discussion this week, talk over any repercussions that should take place from this incident. Should anyone be held accountable for the accident that led to the ships running aground, and if so, whom? What should any companies or businesses affected by the shipping blockage do to try to compensate for the delays caused by this situation? What can governments such as Egypt, through whose territory the canal runs, do to pre prevent situations like this occurring again? This one has six source articles. First one from the Daily Mail. Race to unblock the Suez Canal. Captain blamed Sandstorm for running aground his 200,000-ton megaship and blocking one of the world's most important waterways. Uh, one from Forbes. Suez Canal crisis underscores why business leaders need crisis contingency plans. Uh, you have one for American Shipper. What the Suez Canal accident means to the tanker business. Uh, you have one from Bloomberg. Insurers may be on hook for millions tied to Suez Cal Canal crisis. Oh, we have Sky News, Suez Canal, US, UK firm more standard ever given could mean higher prices for British shoppers. Uh, the South China Morning Post, Suez Canal ship ever given freed, ending week-long crisis in one of the world's busiest trade routes. Okay. So again, three-paragraph response to that topic as well. And then the third one. Third topic is repercussions for voter suppression. That was just posted this morning. Okay. Here's a topic for you. Instant blowback met the controversial signing of a law in Georgia, which has been widely criticized as a voter suppression law. The law in question, among other things it does, removes the Secretary of State from his position at the, as the head of the State Election Commission, reduces early voting periods prior to elections, restricts voting on Sundays, a move seen to directly target black churches sold to the polls drives, limits mail-in voting, outlaws offering basic services such as handing out water to voters waiting in line, and most egregiously to many, allows the state legislature to remove county polling officials if any suspicion of voter fraud is given. An aspect of the law which has been interpreted as blaming the polling officials if the election results aren't what the party in power want. Controversy even accompanied the signing of the bill itself as it was a closed-door signing, photos of which were released showing the Georgia governor signing it under a painting of the slave plantation, and a lawmaker who locked on the door, knocked on the door of the signing wound up arrested and charged with four felonies. The blowback to the law's passage was slightly slow, but highly impactful when it did come. A group of black CEOs took out advertising protests in the law and were soon joined in public denouncement by Georgia-based companies Delta Airlines and Coca-Cola. Soon afterward, and probably more publicly, Major League Baseball announced that this year's All-Star Game, previously scheduled this year to be held in Atlanta, would be withdrawing the game from the city over the passage of the law, a move not unprecedented in the sports world. In 1988, the NFL withdrew the Super Bowl from Arizona over the state's refusal to recognize Martin Luther King Day as a holiday. And in 2017, the NBA withdrew its all-star game from Charlotte over North Carolina's anti-trans bathroom bill. 
Georgia, however, has been trying to fight back. As soon afterwards, state lawmakers announced a threat to take away Delta's tax breaks, and Georgia legislators in Congress announced a reconsideration of Major League Baseball's antitrust status. Even despite this, more businesses are being pressured to boycott or protest the state, including one of the state's biggest investors, Hollywood Studios, filming in the state, the largest being Disney Marvel. For your discussion this week, take a side in this dispute and argue for your chosen side. Is Georgia ensuring a fair vote, or are they specifically targeting minority voters after the 2020 election and their Senate runoffs? Should the businesses speak out against the law or remain silent? How much impact will the MLB decision to take away the All-Star game have? Uh, this one also has six sources for you. Uh, most of them are TV sources. Uh, first one from KGO TV San Francisco. From handing out water to Sunday voting, what to know about Georgia's new Republican electoral law. Uh, WXIA in Atlanta, Georgia companies respond to new voting law signed by Governor Kemp as calls for boycotts rise. We have from CNBC, U.S. companies face boycott threats, mounting pressure to take sides in America's voting rights battle. We have CNN. MLB moving All-Star Game from Georgia after voting law. Uh, the second one's also from CNN. As restrictive voting bills multiply, GOP signals it won't bow to corporate pressure. And then from Deadline, Hollywood, Georgia's, con Hollywood's Georgia conundrum. Restrictive voting laws threaten to turn peach of a location venue into pariah. Okay. Uh, so... Again, three paragraphs at least to uh, take a side in that debate and uh, discuss how you, why you take that side and why your side is right. Okay. All right. So uh, we're, it's 12.55 now. We'll take about five more minutes here. If anybody has any more questions, uh, we'll go ahead and let you get them out there. Uh, raise your hand. Uh, otherwise, you guys can go ahead and take off. Uh, we will have another one of these sessions on Friday at noon. This was supposed to be last Friday, but since it was Good Friday uh, and uh, the holiday had a lot of people uh, elsewhere, uh, I decided to uh, hold off till Monday for this session. Okay, but typically they're going to be on Fridays at noon.
All right, we're going to go ahead and uh, sign this off for today. Uh, we'll see you guys on uh, Friday. Thanks for coming by.